flyish. I should win the S and the sport flyish. I should win the S with me. I should win the S. I should I should win the S with me. I should I should I should I should I should win the S with me. And the sport flyish. I should win the S and the and the sport flyish. I should win the S with me. I should win the S. I should I should win the S with me. I should I should I should I should win the S. 2522, black frames, garrisons. Take a look at my concept, my yes sir, this is madness. What's that on my feet? Some kicks that you ain't never seen. Homie, I don't rock nothing that you can cop from magazines. First class seats, all you haters on the buddy pass. I don't stop for no one, homie. Everything an easy pass. Cruise control when I stroll, I don't even need the gas. This is what it sounds like when you finally eat it last. Grind like a Mexican so I can make some extra cash. I ain't really pressed for nothing, homie. Always in this bag. Even when I'm broken, full of hope that I'ma get some change. Married to the game, all that's missing is a wedding ring. You can ask the pie. They love the way I do my thing. This is how I eat. You could call this the foolish things. And I never share what's on my plate. Have you lost your brain? Don't compare me to them lanes. I ride in a different lane. Welcome to the Sit Down Live. I'm Don Drew. I'm here with uh, one of the best stories in sneakers. Today we have uh, Josh from Campless on. Um, you know, r- real excited for uh, for for Josh and, and the endeavors, he's going to tell you guys a really great story about um, what can happen if you work hard and you try hard and you follow your dreams. Um, really, really, really interesting stuff. Josh, welcome. The show tonight, by the way, is brought to you by Cousins Brand. Uh, the link is in my bio. Anybody who's interested in that apparel, um, check it out. He's got some really cool stuff, fall stuff coming up for, for holiday season. If you're into that, check it out. Josh, welcome to the sit down. Hey Drew, thank you very much for having me. Good to be so, here. So when we first had you on way back, way back in season one, <clears throat> you're a vet of the show. I think you've been on three times. You were on originally season one, and then you were on the Baltimore Sneaker Show, yeah. and now you're back with us. And and what's crazy is from then the first time till now, a shitload of stuff has happened for you. Yeah, which is really cool because I remember being skeptical like man this guy's got a crazy idea and and your nerd ass went ahead and analyzed 22 million ebay auctions go ahead man tell everybody <clears throat> yeah i mean when we first spoke we were just getting this thing going we were just putting campus.com as it exists today out there it was this concept of you know, analyzing eBay data and creating a price guide and, and creating analytics around sneakers. And, um, you know, the intro you gave it is not untrue. Uh, you know, it, it is kind of a, a crazy story and kind of a, a crazy dream come true type of thing that I honestly never expected to end up where I am today from that. And I mean, it is, so so today, let's sorry, we, we can walk, walk our way through parts yeah, of it. So let's go to where you are today. Yeah. <clears throat> We're not gonna talk about where I am today in some shithole hotel in Utica. But um where you are today, let's start there and then kind of backtrack because I think that's the crazy roller coaster ride that you're on. So Go ahead, man. Tell everybody what happened. Where are you? What- yeah, man. Look, I got my I got my Detroit hat and everything, right? Like, I live in Detroit. I live in Detroit and from and Philly. From Philly, I live in Detroit and I work for Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans and uh, about a hundred other uh, companies. And now he is, uh, you know, a partner with me in Campus, and uh, and have the opportunity to take what started as a complete side project and turn it into a full-blown business with all of the support and resources of one of the most successful business people in history um, working you know, alongside me to, to make this happen. So I'm sitting in my house in Detroit where I've now been for about three weeks. I finally got my whole family here, but for the past you know, five, six months, there's been this long transition of, of, of moving my, my life and my family and my business here. So how did it happen? So you're you know, plugging away, getting help from friends for free, building the site, beta. I remember when you you sent me the beta test, the app, the whole nine, you know, again, as a side project, you were working full time doing that probably late nights, right? Yeah, man. And then all of a sudden, you know, boom. So how does that happen? Did it happen overnight? Did you have other offers? 
you know, what happened and, yeah. and how rich are you? <laughs> uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not that rich uh, of all the people that, uh, that Dan Gilbert employs, uh, the most, mo- the people that most of you guys know, they're, they're much richer than I am. Right. Uh, we're not in that same stratosphere of the guys in the cabs, but, um, it, uh, look, it, it, it started as a side project and it started where um, we put this out there and people started reaching out saying, Hey, you know, I love sneakers. I love data. Can I help? And, uh, and that was very surprising. And I never counted on even that. And I was like, sure, you know, we'll, we'll find something for you to do. And slowly over time, we built this amazing volunteer army. When, when I left campus or when I left my full-time job at IBM to go do this full time about four months ago at the time, there were 17 volunteers who were working with campus in some capacity. And I mean, look, I, I probably put in more time than all 17 of them combined, but they all helped immeasurably. I mean, there were six developers and three designers and some people that did data work and a kid in college that ran an Instagram account. And, and, and that all happened because within sneakers, we all, you know, we all are part of whatever this sneaker community is and we all love sneakers. But within that, there's a million different other interests, right? There's some people that like basketball and some people that like hip hop and there's some people like whatever. And there's some small slice of people that also really like data and the analytics that came with it. And I think it tapped into those people to be like, I would love to just be a part of this. And so I mean, look, we probably screened easily over a hundred people to eventually find those 17 to that ended up working with us. Right. And at one point there was a, a kid in college who went to Cornell who said, you know, I'm a mobile developer. Uh, you know, I can build your app. I was like, great. Well, awesome. Like let's, let's build our app, you know, and, and he did it. And, and, you know, and, and then some, some, another guy came along and was like, you know, why well, do a uh, data visualization? I can help you, you know, do some other, you know, things. Did great. you move any of them yeah. to Detroit with you? Uh, yeah. Um, so, when the deal closed, um, I was I came by myself first, and there are two members of the campus volunteer staff who we have hired full time. Um, one of which happens to be my brother, which is uh, not a a nepotism hire, but he was been with me from day one and kind of do all of the things that I could do on the data side. Also understands the sneakers, and he's in the process of moving his family here. And then um, our lead developer, who is based in uh, Seattle, um, we've kind of hired him right now as almost a full-time contractor. We're trying to get him to move to Detroit, but he's basically full-time on this as well. And then another developer is also kind of a part-time contractor on this as well. So we have three, and I'm trying to get about another one or two of those guys to come with us as well, because we have a full-time, full-time team of nine people already here in Detroit between the people that we've hired and then the campus volunteers that have come. So I went from doing this on the side with 17 volunteers, which is purely a, you know, a, a passion, per, you know, to have a full-time team to go out and hire great developers and designers and, and have a, a full team here in Detroit. What's the significance of Detroit? Detroit is where uh, Dan Gilbert and his uh, organization is based. Every one of his companies, except for the Cavs, is based in Detroit and Quicken Loans is uh, his largest and, and most prominent company. And Dan's from the, the Detroit area. And I don't know what was maybe five, six years ago, um, decided to basically overnight move every one of his businesses into downtown Detroit and slowly start help revitalizing the city. And he's certainly not the only one doing stuff in Detroit, but he's got to be the most prominent. And they, uh, he is, I am, I'm sitting in a city that is at the cusp of a rebuilding of a major American city. It is unbelievable what's going on here. And it's only now that they're starting to get sort of leak out into the rest of the country of all of the revitalization going on here. And I didn't know before I started this process and started working with Dan and getting to know them. So did you get a call from Dan directly? Uh, no, uh, no. Um, uh, so how, do, I mean, how does it happen? Like how does, how do you, you know, you get a call one day and says, Hey, you know, we're interested in, in buying your entity. Yeah. How so, does that, how does that unfold? Right. So yeah, it's, it's not from Dan directly. Right. Uh, uh, I guess billionaires don't make the first call uh, in that, but throughout the past year um, I've spoken with a lot of different people within the sneaker industry, whether it's the blogs or resellers or the brands, or the retailers or eBay or flight club or, or lots of different people trying to figure out who is the right, partner who could we work with who can i you know there was enough 
there was enough really going on at campus that it was clear, right, let's do this full time, let's, let's do something with this, but who can we partner with to do that? And so I've been getting a lot of calls from random people as well, kind of outside looking in saying, you know, we see what's going on in the sneaker industry, we want to get involved. And that's always a very skeptical call, right? I mean, you and I have at, certainly over the last three, four years have had all sorts of people say, oh, you know, what's going on in sneakers? I want to get involved. I want to make some money, sure. whatever. And most of those calls, you know, were very easily dismissed and kind of whatever. But one day I get a call from two guys that say, listen, we work for Dan Gilbert. We're really interested in the sneaker space. We like what you're doing. Can we talk? And sure, right? You take every phone call, you know, have every conversation. And I have, I have a conversation that is word for word, like I've had a hundred times. I mean, it, it's like, it could have been on tape record from like every other ones. I didn't think anything of it. And two days later, um, they email me back and say, listen, we're definitely going to move forward with this business. We definitely want to work with you. And we'd like to fly you to Cleveland to go to a game and meet Dan. Well, the first part of that statement, I'm like, whatever. Everybody says they're going to do shit. Like, who cares? Right. right. The second half so you of that. Like, you were getting pump faked. Yeah. Well, the second half, I'm like, absolutely, you can fly me to Cleveland and go to a game. I'm there. Right. You know, like, done. This was, it was, uh, it was like two days before Easter. And, you know, they're like, it's short notice. Can you come out on, you know, Sunday, Easter? You know, I'm like, I'm Jewish. Yeah, sure. Send me a ticket. Like, let's go. Right. So I fly from Philly to Cleveland and it's an afternoon game against the Bulls. And the idea is I fly in in the morning and then go to the game and then and fly home. And uh, a relevant side note, this is my wife is 39 weeks pregnant at the time. Right. So oh, I, I one my. kid about to have my, my second kid, my son. And uh, so I fly in, I go to the game, um, you know, they're coming down from Detroit. So I show up at the game by myself um, and someone finds me and they like walk me down, they walk me all the way down the floor and they sit me literally right next to LeBron, like right next to LeBron because the Cavs bench is here and the owner seats are like here at like the intersection of the corner of the court. And so they sit me in here, but none of the other people for the owners are there. And LeBron's just sitting at the end, like tying his shoes, like where he gets ready for the game. And like, I'm not bothering the guy. I don't say anything to him. Right? He's like, that's yeah, fucking dope though. Yeah. But it's like, we're like this far apart. And I'm like, okay, like this is fucking cool. Right. Like, right, yeah. You know? And by the way, like, you know, for anyone who's been that close to LeBron, I mean, he's like a walking statue. It's unbelievable. You know, but that's one. So anyway, so a couple minutes later, Dan and, and his guy show up and, and we sit and we watch the game and kind of make small talk. And then after the game, we go back into the owner's lounge or, you know, owner's like locker room. And we start talking and, you know, kind of get to know you, tell about campus, me and, and what's going on. And, um, you know, and to this point, I'd had uh, a, a good number of offers, whether they were acquisition offers or whether they were partnership offers or whether they were, you know, uh, offers to license our data or job offers from, from different people within the industry. And none of them made sense for me. It was like either either the people were good, but I didn't like the vision or the money was good, but you know, I didn't like the people or whatever it was. It just didn't fit. Right. And in every one of those meetings, I had this like one piece of paper when I started campus three years ago, that was like this pie in the sky vision for what it could become. This like sort of product roadmap. It was like this one piece of paper I used to take with me everywhere and kind of show people. I was like, you know, this is kind of what I think campus can be. This is the idea. And every person said, oh, that's pretty cool. But you know, what we're doing is this. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Right. Everyone's got their business. They're doing what they want to do. No problem. But no one ever. So I said, I do the same thing. And I show it to Dan. I show it to two guys working with them. And they look at me like I have three heads and they, they look at me with like pure shock. Right. And one of them like takes a piece of paper out of his hand. He's like, it's like, yeah, we have one of those. Like, that's exactly what we want to do. And I'll save the, like what that is you know, for another time and as we, you know, launch stuff, public, but we had the exact same idea about what to do with campus and how to build it into a bigger company, which was just, so I was like, oh, okay. And so of all the other reasons why we eventually get together and like not to be undersold, you know, Dan's network and who he is and, and the, what you can do by being part of that, but we had the exact same idea. There was exactly one other person in the whole world that had the exact same idea for this as me. And it happens to be one of the most successful business people in the world. So does he and write a number? Does he write a number on a piece of paper and slide it across the table? No, it, you'd like to, to make it think that way, right? Like some movies, like, you know, here it is. No, um, what happens is um, we're clearly aligned at this point and we've clearly crossed enough of the threshold that Dan has is sufficiently satisfied with me 
And so he says, you know, we got to get you out to Detroit and see what's going on in Detroit, you know, and meet some other people. And, and you know, I'm like, okay. So it's a Sunday. So I say, um, well, you know, my week's pretty light this week at IBM. I'm sure I can find time to come out there. Um, you know, just let me know. His guy like opens up his calendar and he's like, you know, how about like Tuesday or Wednesday? And Dan's like, why don't you just come back on our jet right now? I'm like, okay. I'm like, uh, sure. You know? So, so we literally leave there. I text my wife again, who's there now, like not coming home, you know, like, please don't go into labor. I text her at work. I'm like, not showing up at work tomorrow, you know? And we fly right from Cleveland to Detroit. Keep talking about, you know, sneakers, about the whole thing. Um, all day Monday gives me, they give me a tour of Detroit, tour of all, all of everything that Dan's doing, meet people, talk to Dan, talk to the team, all this sort of stuff. At the end of the day, Monday, you know, Dan says, you know, we'd like you to stay another day. Can you keep talking? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, so I text my wife, like not coming home today either. You know, she's like, it's better be a real fucking good story. Like it is, <laughs> it is, you know, labor, right? So, uh, at the end of the day, Tuesday, I finally, you're going to let me go home and go back into Dan's office. And he's like, listen, he's like, you know, we think that, you know, you're the guy to lead this. We want you to, you know, we want to, to, um, you know, acquire campus. We want to, um, you know, have you come here and, and run the company. And, um, and, you know, a couple of days later, uh, you know, the email, they, you know, give me an offer and, uh, we negotiate for a little while the email and then, uh, mid May, we finally shook hands and, and agreed on it. So it was, um, how was stiff were you on your price? How tough a negotiator were we, were you with the guy who owns Quicken Loans, man? Most people who I've told the story and gone through the full numbers and everything else, which I'm not going to share here, right? Give but us a hint, people, though. Most people thought that uh, they were pretty surprised with how uh, aggressive I was. But at the same time, uh, I feel like we got to a fair place pretty quickly. And, you know, like I, there was there – was, you know, all you can say is no, right? All you can say is no. Seven figures. You did. You motherfucker, you got seven figures. Good job, man. So from a, a, a startup, just as a guy who likes sneakers, just tinkering around with a, compu a computer nerd who likes sneakers, right? you turned it into <clears throat> essentially a life-changing situation, man. That's incredible. And then look and all of it. It's the, the deal, the, the opportunity, all that is, is amazing, but it's now I get to do this full time and I get the resources and right. not, not only the money, right. But the, the network and to have someone who's that committed to doing something with this and, and to make it because I've always thought that campus has applications beyond you know, just sneakers. And a guy like Dan Gilbert doesn't become interested in this if there's not a bigger play here, right? He's not interested in like, how do you beat Kixify, right? It's like, you know, what's the bigger opportunity here and how do you do this? And, you know, what else can you, you know, how do you make this something a lot bigger? And that's the, the great thing. And now I get to go and do that. And I get to go to work every day around sneakers and actually, you know, be a part of something bigger. So it, it's it's all that stuff combined. That's crazy, man. What was your wife's reaction when you call her up, or or <laughs> you, maybe you were home when the final like negotiation came through? Like, what was your wife's reaction? Was she like flipping? Did she go into labor as soon as she, as soon as she heard the the numbers? Um, well, again, you know, it's 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 not. It wasn't nearly as about the numbers as it was the just the full story and the opportunity that was happening. Right. Um, so when I finally got home late that Tuesday night. Right. So I left Sunday morning. I got home like Tuesday night and uh, my wife had, was like, had waited up for me and I don't know, it was 1130 midnight and we stayed up for a couple hours. And I was just telling her, you know, sort of every detail about the weekend and explaining to her Dan and the organization, and everything else. And like, you know, by the end of that, that night, she said, well, we're moving to Detroit. And this was before any numbers before, you know, it was just like, just the opportunity of doing like this, this isn't a job that like, you know, gets posted at Craigslist, like to just go and work with someone like that is, is a dream come true alone from any person in any aspect of business. So that and combined with everything else, by the end of that night, you know, there was no like, oh, you know, you, you got to do this. And she was like, yeah, we're going obviously, right. Um, and then everything else is, is gravy, you know, on top of that, as you work through the logistics of, of making that happen. But um, it's, it's also great to have someone that was fully supportive because we don't know anyone in Detroit. We've never been here. Totally. You need that. 
you can't make a, a major life changing move without having that. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's really dope, man. So now do you have like a campus office? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, ha- we have an office, um, in the, uh, the main building where, um, uh, well, Quicken Loans and, and all of Dan's businesses are in a lot of buildings downtown in Detroit. And we're in the same building that, uh, that Dan is in. And uh, we have a team, like I said, a team of uh, like eight full-time people. And a couple. And what are you looking to get to? How many people? What, what's the vision for where you're? I don't know if there's, there's definitely a number. I mean, uh, after the next um, launch, so we just launched collections and, and we're in the process of, of put it, pushing that out. And we have enough team and we have the right team to get through the re- the next few product cycles. Um, and then we'll see, right? We'll see it as a thing. So I don't think there's a, a exact number, you know, we got to get 20 people or whatever. You can always use more developers, right? Right now we're, and abs- anyone out there, like we need, uh, you know, mobile developer help, right? We could use more mobile developers for sure. We would add those people right away. But besides that, it's just a function of, you know, as the business grows, figure out what that looks like pretty that's it's it's crazy so what's collections yeah so this has been one of the most requested features um since i started campus and one of the things we've wanted to build for the longest time and it's a sneaker portfolio it's literally like you would go online to your schwab brokerage account or something and see the way that your your stocks and, and bonds or whatever are performing it's the same thing so to view your collection and see its value its value over time uh, and all sorts of metrics that you might get if you were on your broker statement. So you can th- see things like gain or loss per shoe, you know, based on what you paid for it and what the market value is. Uh, you can see things like, um, you know, the how much your collection has changed over time and then compare it and rank it to others because, you know, what do we like to do except for, you know, compare ourselves to other people's collections and see, you know, my collection's worth the most and I have the most pairs or, or whatever it is. And it's a pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot of fancy stuff to it today, but the basics are there so that you can build your collection and see what it's worth and, and see what other people's are worth. And what's the, so how many people are registered on collections right now? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, I haven't looked in the past couple of days, um, but I'm going to say there were maybe about 6,000 the last time I looked. Wow. Um, What's and the total, re- what's Campus's total reach? How many people do you reach? How many people downloaded the app? Um, the, well, so before this, before the announcement and before uh, all of this, um, I don't know, it was maybe like 30,000 or something total. Okay. Uh, and that was also about the same monthly reach of the website. Um, but I feel like a lot of our content, you know, gets syndicated, right? We're not a content, you know, company. We don't pump out 50 posts a day, like, you know, the sneaker blogs. And we also don't have any, we, up until collections, we didn't have any, there was no profile. There was no reason to sort of come back beyond just the price guide. And so a lot of times the, the reach of our individual posts would get, you know, amplified when it gets, you know, reposted by other people or picked up by, you know, New York times or these other folks as well. But um, so I just checked. So we're just under 6,000 collections that have been created in the two and a half weeks since we launched it, um, which is probably about what we, we figured would happen initially. So, and for those that registered for collections, so for anyone who hasn't registered, if you register your collection, you are eligible to win one of 73 pairs of shoes. Yep. Yeah. So this is something that we were going to do we were building collections before we met Dan, right? And obviously we were able to expedite it and, and have really talented people work on it to push it out. And so this concept of a big giveaway we were doing also before we met Dan, um, but we're giving away 73 pairs of sneakers. Um, we wanted to do something big and we came up with that number because it happened to be 73 weeks since we had launched the site uh, when we launched the promotion. And um, fortunately through relationships that we have and that people I've met, we've been able to get a a lot of pretty significant sneakers at reasonable prices, right? That I've been able to give them away. I mean, we don't, we didn't get them for free, but I certainly, you know, didn't have to pay market price for, you know, Don C's, et cetera, but we were able to get a lot and we're giving away easy boost and Don C's and Chrome posits and 
you know, Kobe nine, you know, multi IDs and, and all sorts of Jordan ones. There's Jordan one Jeters and Jordan one Chicago's and Jordan one shatter backboards and DSMs and, uh, and lots of ASICs and, and lots of concepts. Uh, there's like 10 different concepts collabs and five different Ronnie collabs and uh, a couple of the nice Diodoras. I mean, it goes on and, on and it's all on the, the, there's a blog post that we update every day as we, we release them. And um, the idea is kind of like the NBA draft lottery. So we will pick 73 winners. Uh, and you can earn entries for different things, such as creating a collection or creating a cop list, which is the corollary of a, a collection, right? What do you want to buy? And, um, and well, it'll be, you know, it'll be anonymous. It'll be totally random. And, and we will pick. And whoever gets picked first will get their choice of one of 73 pairs. And they want to choose whatever their size is because there's various sizes for your shoes. Sure. You want to choose the most expensive pair? Sure. Whatever you want, right? And so forth. And so the second person gets a choice of what's left and, and on and on. So, you know, kind of like the draft lottery, but something fun that, you know, you can get whatever you want. And, you know, you know, there are some, there's like, we did a GR day a couple of days ago and we had put like five or six pairs into the collection that are all something you could pick up for, for retail anywhere. But with the exception of that, almost everything is something that has a value on the secondary market, retro Jordans, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it should be fun and people should be excited. I think. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. So, who, who came to, who made you offer that was like, whom, who made some, who, is there anyone out there that made a bad offer? Is there anyone out there that like, you were like, come on, man. Um, yes. Um, I won't, I'm not going to say who it's not, you know, but there were definitely people that did that. Um, there were definitely folks that made offers that for me weren't, weren't substantial enough to move the needle, but I recognize that given what their business is, right? So this is, so first there are certain people that were, that's fucking crazy, but there are also people that's like, yeah, like it's only worth what it's worth to your business and what you want to do with it. Because it's not like campus had a whole bunch of revenue. It's not like we had, you know, Instagram and had, you know, millions and millions of users like that. You, you don't want to out the low ball offers, right? the bums. You don't want to out the bums in the low ball nah, office. Nah, that's okay. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to toss one up to the, to the, nah, nah, they, they, you know, they know who they are. It's fine. Um, but Matt, how will give you a, a low ball offer at the end of the day. Nope. At the end of the day, um, Come on, man. it's only worth what, what you think you can do with it and how you can leverage your business. Right. It's not like we had this huge cash flow, So it was a hard thing to value. It was a hard thing to value. It made the negotiations hard, but that's, that's the way it is. But, you know, there's, um, you know, there's lots of people in the sneaker industry. So really, really, really cool story. So what do you, what do you see as the, the future? I mean, listen, I mean, there's thousands and millions and millions of people that want, wish they could do what you did and they can't, not everybody can, but, um, you know, you worked real hard at it. You didn't, you know, you didn't just, you know, you didn't just have an idea and, and not execute. I mean, you know, similar to what John Geiger said a couple of weeks ago when he was on is that, you know, everybody can have an idea, but not everybody can execute and you yeah. executed, but what's the future? Yeah. Um, I mean, so first to that point, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like it doesn't happen overnight, right? The, the, the final thing happens overnight, right? Where someone calls you and all of a sudden it, it you know, it changes from what you're doing, but um, you know, I had legitimately two full-time jobs where I was working easy 60 hours a week on both for, you know, three years. Right. And like pretty much didn't sleep and, and had all the support of my wife to help take care of my kid, you know, while that was going on. So, um, it was, you know, um, but that said, you know, it, there's also a lot of like just right place at right time and, and all that. So it's all that stuff combined that just has to happen, which is, you can't even plan for it. I couldn't have planned any of this, you know, you know, when I started it, um, but you know, the future is to take this thing and, and, and build it into a, a legitimate and bigger business and, and see how you can leverage this, not only within sneakers, um, but in other areas of, you know, of commerce of other areas of the world to, to make it a, you know, a larger and more substantial business. But day one, um, you know, we're going to keep doing what we do and, but just do it better and be able to collect and produce more data and, and create more interesting, you know, data content around that. And at the end of the day, it's got to be useful for sneakerheads as a price guy. Like that's always been like the well, most fundamental thing. Well, let me be the cynic for a second because yeah. I'm good at that. I am good at that. 
you're only taking a sampling from one, although it's the largest one, yeah. from one area. The only data you collect is eBay. Shoes yeah, get it. sold on Twitter. Shoes get sold on Instagram a lot. Yep. Shoes get sold on Kixify. They get sold on uh, consignment all across the world and so many different platforms. How can you base your information and call it legitimate if it's solely based only on one platform? Yeah. No, will be the largest one. Yeah. No, look, that, that is absolutely fair, right? And frankly, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's, it's good to be able to discuss that and talk through it. So um, first of all, eBay has the largest amount of traffic by a long shot, right? I mean, it's got you know, about a third of the entire market and it also, you know, there's not a single uh, entity that has even, you know, even a, a fifth of what eBay has, you know, and, and most probably don't even have like a tenth. Um, so it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of time to, to collect and clean data to make it useful to be able to extract things like average price. And each channel has a different challenge to do that. So cleaning eBay data is different than cleaning Twitter data or cleaning Instagram or Kixify or Flight Club or um, you know, Collect or any of these other sneaker markets. And we only publicly uh, use eBay data and only publicly base the price on eBay data, but we collect all sorts of other data and are constantly testing, spot testing, right? To make sure that we're in the same, you know, that, that these are, reasonable and rational uh, values to be putting out there based on the market. So eBay also has the benefit, and this is happens to be this way, right? It could have could have worked out differently, but eBay is, is right in the middle of pricing. There are places you can buy sneakers for a lot more. Consignment shops, flight club, you can pay a lot more than eBay. And there are places where you can get it cheaper, like Twitter and Instagram, if you know how to navigate the, the you know sneaker Twitter and find deals there. So it also has the benefit of kind of like being right in the middle. So between that and between us, we do collect and test other data to make sure that we're still, you know, reasonable. You know, we think it's the best estimate. That said, as we can get better people, systems, et cetera, we will continue to bring in other data sources to you know, continue to augment. But at the end of the day, there's so little volume in any of those other channels that it wouldn't even impact the price very much anyway, because the volume at eBay would skew whatever, you know, bring in whatever we have from collect, right? It just doesn't compare. Drew, I think you're on mute. You're muted. Shit, my bad. Yeah. I had Corgi on the show. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that he says is the shoes that he posts, they're so hard to find in DS condition that the guide really isn't fair because... Sure. If your guide says the average price sold for a dead stock shoe would be $280 per set, but he has a pair that is dead stock and you really can't, you really can't, um, that's right. Find it anywhere. He can sell it for whatever he wants. Absolutely. So doesn't that nullify your guide? It doesn't nullify it. Right. So at the end of the day, um, any, any price guide, any uh, analytics used on um, sneaker pricing is historical. It's what happened in the past. And um, people can use that however they want as, um, as some sort of, to, to educate them about what's going on, right? And a shoe like that, if there was one pair, if there were two pairs of whatever shoe core you sell on, right? I, I don't know, a, a, a 2000 and, and um, uh, I don't know, a, a, um, I don't know, whatever, pick a, you know, any, a Jordan three mocha, something that like no one's seen for a while. And, and he comes up with a DS pair of those, right? Well, right. like how many pairs have, have been sold on eBay in the last year? Maybe one, maybe two. So yeah, we'll tell you what those two sold for. But at the end of the day, he's the only one holding another dead stock pair. And right. it, so it's whatever he wants and whatever he wants to charge for. And you can say the, the buyer can say, all they want. well, look, the other two only sold for this. It's like, great. You know, go find it somewhere else. Right. And this happens with all sneakers that usually once you get 18 months, 24 months, and then a little farther out, there's so few dead stock pairs available because, you know, they find their way in the hands of people that want them, people wear them, that the seller really can sort of ask whatever they want. 
But that doesn't mean it's not useful to know that the other two pairs sold for whatever they did. You know, but a market price is only what whatever someone's willing to pay for it. And, that, and that's, that's the real definition of a market price. So the original data guy in this industry was one of my biggest fans, Matt Powell. Yeah. And um, he does a little different in that he's taking info funneled through brands and retailers, stuff that's not common knowledge by publicly traded entities, right? Mm-hmm. And putting that out there and, and building a following back on that. So what's your relationship with him? And how do you two intersect in the data world? Yeah. So um, I haven't talked to Matt in a long time. I've never met him in person. Um, but he was one of the very first people to see what we were doing. And, um, and he thought it was cool. I mean, we have, we have z- almost zero overlap in the data that we look at or in, the, you know, in what we do. Um, and so he was, uh, he was a fan. He's like, this is interesting stuff. People should know about it. And, um, and at one point he would share some data with me if I needed to know something for analysis or whatever. Um, I think that he switched companies. And so I don't know if he has that same leeway to do that, but we've always had a cordial relationship. I've never, you know, tried to argue with him about Kanye. So, you know, we don't have to go, you know, like, but we don't have the same data. He deals with retail data. It's a, it's, there's a lot of, we have a lot of the same people that look at our data on the, the business side, right? So we actually sell data to investment firms um, and to other people within the sneaker industry. We don't have nearly the same business that he does or that any other retail data analysts do. But there are some investment firms who buy our data because they want to have more information about making investment decisions, usually around public companies in space, so Foot Locker, Nike, Finish Line. And He's got, you know, he and, and the other one, I guess he's NPD and Sports One Source are kind of like the two big ones for, for footwear. Um, they have much bigger operations and sell a lot more data. But, you know, we have a handful of reports. So we sell a handful of clients. And that is probably the only place where we overlap. Those clients are the same. I always found personally, and this is kind of where me and Matt went awry. Um, but, and it wasn't so much about Kanye, but it was that I always found that his data was just regurgitated from the ticker that he can pull off wall street and the, you know, and the, he posed it as inside information when in fact it really wasn't and the data was flawed and having inside knowledge of the industry from my retail background. I knew that challenged him on some things. He made some very strong opinions that were, that were wrong. And, and you're a guy who deals specifically with facts and with numbers. And I, you know, yeah. I guess I thought it was interesting that, you know, the two of you guys could have a parallel relationship on some level being that one spews flawed data that's regurgitated and another one analyzes and creates his own data. I, you probably have a better insight into whatever flaws there are in Matt's data than I do. Right. I just, I'm not a retail data expert. You know, I don't collect and look at that and you have a lot of retail experience that you might can actually like pick that stuff out. Right. Um, and it's never been, it's never come up or been necessary for me to, to have that level of interaction with him. Right. And so um, you know, there's never been that, that need to, to make that decision uh, on whether that's, you know, good or bad or whatever. But, you know, again, is there's a lot of similarities, I think, in what we do, but, you know, we really don't intersect in any way. We don't really work together in any way, um, but just, you know, from distance. Look, he also, I come at this a completely different way, right? Like, I've been collecting sneakers since I was, you know, whatever, eight. And, uh, you know, and he makes a habit of telling everyone that he doesn't even wear sneakers, right? So, yeah, there's, there's that too. Right. So, as you get ready to, to, to build your business, right, and you have the support and the resources, you know, listen, man, it's really nice to do a job when you have the right tools to do it. Yeah. You know, it's hard. To, it's, it's hard. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to build something or do something around the house and you don't have the right tools and you're trying to use a wrench when you need a pliers, it's just not going to work. And it's nice for you to be able to have those tools. Give, I mean, you got to give us a nugget, give us something that you see campless aspiring to give, give the sneaker world something to look forward to something dope and new that you're doing outside of or that you want to do outside of collections, 
and and that collections was, is two weeks old. Collections is two weeks old. That's not enough. There's more though. <laughs> Look, there's definitely more. Um, we've always thought that the you know the campus methodologies that apply elsewhere. You know, I want to give a a analogy first, right? So, um, are you familiar with the the website uh, Genius, which used to be Rap Genius? Yes. Right, where you annotate, you know, it's basically annotating rap lyrics. Doesn't well, Dan Gilbert own that too? Uh, he doesn't own it. He is a, he is an investor in it, and I think he okay. has a, a, a significant amount of money in that, and I think that that's public. Um, and as do a lot of other uh, really big time Silicon Valley VCs have some serious money in that. And there was a when they when that company took its first round, and it was I think this round was like fifteen million dollars from from Andreessen Horowitz. Um, everyone was like, "What the fuck?" Like people are investing all this money. Like the top VC in Silicon Valley is investing fifteen million dollars into a site that talks about rap lyrics. And but there's a really bigger idea behind that, which is like this concept of, you know, can you annotate the internet? Like can you bring in this this other layer of of data of, of information that can help inform and be this huge idea. I mean, that, that could be a, that literally could be completely change the entire internet if you have that. And, and I'm not saying that we're on that level. Genius gets, you know, 30 million views a day. Um, but it's the same idea around building businesses and products around data that, you know, can become, you know, that have much broader applications, right? And I think that's what Dan saw on campus. And I think that's, I know that that's what we've always thought it could be, right? So as an example, right? If you have the ability to see pricing, right? To know what the market is actually showing for any given, call it a widget, right? Whatever you're buying, a sneaker, anything else, right? Just having more information in one place should allow people to make better educated decisions and it should should allow for a better flow of commerce and a better flow of, of everything so like look at the you know i'm giving a, a, a ted talk right in next week right like big ted organization like not tedx and the title of the talk is sneakerhead data and the future of all online commerce right and that's a huge idea right but the more information you can bring about anything that you're buying online, right? The, the opportunities abound for doing that, right? The internet is literally built for people to buy and sell things. It's crazy, but you didn't answer the question. I gave some really good hints in there. I gave some really good hints in there. The, the, it's, it's coming. We look, you provide more information about things that people want to buy. How involved is Dan in your day to day? everything how involved is he um well look he owns quick loans and the cabs and and about 120 other businesses and um uh and he's is integrally involved in all this uh, city of detroit revitalization um you know that said uh, i think he probably spends a disproportionate amount of time with us than other uh, businesses which doesn't say that we don't see him every day or talk to him every day by any means right um but he is really passionate about this and uh and helps and you know whenever we need him you know he'll be there and and help so uh way more so than you would probably expect but obviously not you know day to day read an article a couple of weeks ago that detroit is the new silicon valley you see it absolutely absolutely uh, you know a big part of what um the growth here is you know it's not like you're going to go create a new uh, auto manufacturer, right? And that's how you're going to rebuild the city. Um, it's easier to build a city in small chunks. And so uh, this deal that we have and, and through Dan is also with uh, a company or a venture fund called Detroit Venture Partners, of which Dan is the, the primary owner, but it's more or less, it is a venture farm here in Detroit and has, I don't know, about 12 different startups that mo almost all work within their uh you know, building and they have, so they have all these startups and they have sort of building this startup community and it feels like that. And, um, and more and more startups continue to open up here every day and, and they're making that um, very accessible, you know, because of all the things that Dan and the rest of City Detroit are doing to welcome them. And a great example of that is that there is a company called Rocket Fiber, which, you know, if you've heard of Google Fiber, Google Fiber is this idea of, you know, high speed internet, you know, delivered to the whole city, 
Um, and they've been testing it in Kansas City, and it's been going on for years. And Rocket Fiber is basically the same thing. And it's a Detroit company that Dan is an investor in, and it is, you know, helping to, and that, you know, is moving a lot quicker than Google Fiber, and you'll have that out there. And so when you have something like that, you know, high-speed internet built across the entire city, right? And you have this startup that really has the possibility to be as big of a company in the world as any others, right? Think about free internet across the entire world, outside, everywhere you go, right? We've always, like, that should happen. We all know that should happen at, at some length. And like, that company is based here in Detroit and helping to you know, start the whole Detroit ecosystem and having startups built on top of it. So it's like cool stuff like that. And there's other companies like that, but that's, that's a great example of it. So it is, it is absolutely, but it's small, right? It, you got to start somewhere there. Really cool. So the expansion of campus, how far outside of sneakers are you going to take it? Look, um, Day one and, you know, for the immediate future, um, it won't be at all, right? Like we need to be focused on sneakers and continue doing what we're doing. Um, but I think that there's an application to that, to almost anything that, almost anything that isn't a complete commodity, right? Say toilet paper or, you know, uh, plastic forks, right? Like doesn't work for that. And it doesn't work for complete unique one-of-a-kind items are houses right but every almost everything else there is a market for it there's some finite quantity of that product and so there is a you know you can create a market around it so that's the the big big idea of like almost everything in the world except for those two you know top and bottom but it's a slow you know there's right. some obvious you know next steps you know other it's not going to be that slow that guy has the resources and the wherewithal he's going to make you move fast and and I think you have the ability and the wherewithal to do it. That's true. Man, you, you won the fucking lottery. You really yes. did. Yes. Um, there, there's, there's no question that it is, uh, it's pretty crazy. And, and to have those resources to do it. I mean, you got to build the business logically and in the right way. But yeah, you know, as, as quick as we can without disrupting what, you know, we have to do, right? And day one, like we have to get better in sneakers. Well, listen, man. Hey, I appreciate, you know, an hour of your time. We, uh, you know, we were on board with you from day one, um, and we're going to continue to support you and watch you, you know, as you get richer and richer and richer, don't forget, come, you know, come on the show, come back anytime yeah. you want. And, um, there, and were, there were, let me say there were three really pivotal moments in the trajectory of campus. And the first one was the first time I appeared on the show. The second one was there was an article in 538, Nate Silver's blog, it's owned by ESPN that really opened up. To outside the world. And the third was, you know, was when the you know, Dan Gilbert's team called me. And those three are the, like, you can pivot where you can really see a change in uh, the, every, you know, everything that we've had access to. And as people become aware and stuff like this, but you guys were the first people to have me on here before really anyone knew about it. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Well, that's real dope. And, and I'm happy to be a part of that shit. That's, that's really three uh, to be to be thirty three percent of of that list. There is is something I'm proud of, and I'm happy for you, Josh. I, I'm I'm really happy to see, listen. I've seen a lot of people in this industry over the twenty plus years that I've been in it. I've seen a lot of people win. I've seen a lot of people lose, and uh, I root like hell for the guys that win because I think any time that you you chase your dreams and you work hard, and you can earn something, you you, you deserve everything that's coming to you. So keep cracking at it, man, and. Uh, you know, listen, we'll be in touch. We'll talk, we, yeah, you know, and, and, and I'm on your side, man. Keep winning. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And anything it. that you need from us, anything you need from me and, 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 and the show, just let me know and, and we'll kick it. I, you know, I'd love to bring the show out to Detroit and hey, man. cool, you know, let's talk about it and yeah, yeah, and we'll go from there. So yeah, that's a real possibility. There's always anything that we can do to, to promote Detroit. I'm on that bandwagon with Dan and, and we, you know, continue to, yeah, absolutely. That'd be cool. Great. Hey, man, thanks for an hour. Yep, thank you so, very much. So uh, next week, we are, we're coming back Tuesday night. Hopefully, I won't be on the road. We will have uh, Rack, now the new director of operations for Kicks on Fire. So big gig for Rack, and he's got a lot to talk about. And we'll ask him everything about his new gig and what his, his plan is to revitalize what it really is a, a struggling a struggling entity there at Kicks on Fire. So... Rack will be a good guest. I'm looking forward to talking to him. 
thank you, Josh, and uh, everybody who watched. Just sit down, and we're out. Copper magazines, first class seats, all you haters on a buddy pass. I don't stop for no one, homie. Everything an easy pass.